Welcome to the book of Jeremiah the prophet. We last heard of Jeremiah at the end of the book of Second Chronicles, where it mentions Jeremiah having been alive towards the end of the reign of Josiah. And then after Josiah, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, next kings of Israel over a period of maybe 40 years, where Jeremiah lives through and uh, after. And we'll find out all about what happens during this period of time. It begins in the book of Jeremiah, the saying of God, which came unto Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. So now, right here, we have a narrator speaking. Jeremiah, I do not believe, is the one that's uh, saying this. Somebody is writing it down, possibly Baruch, his uh, anemonesis. And so, and he's telling us uh, that uh, words, the saying of God, which came unto Jeremiah, the son of Helkiah, uh, from out of the priests who dwelt in uh, Anathoth, uh, in the land of Benjamin, Benjamin. So it tells us a lot right here. It tells us that Jeremiah is of the sons of Aaron because he is a priest. He's of the priests. And Anathoth was only about three miles north of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah was in to the know of all the things going on uh, in Jerusalem. And it continues, uh, as uh, the word of God came to him in the days of Eosiu, Josiah, who I mentioned, the son of, uh, son of Ammon, who was the, he was a grandson of Hezekiah. Ammon was a son, lived only three months, I believe, or three years. Uh, he was the king of, son of Hilkiah, from out of the priests who dwelt in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what I'm just going by. I missed the link here. Uh, king of Judah uh, in the 13th year of his kingship. Uh, you can add that word to the English derivatives book. Uh, we have tri, K, and deca is 10, so 13, 13th of his vasalia. And it took place in the days of Eoakim, son of Josiah. And as I mentioned, Josiah had four sons. Three, uh, th um, three of them became king, and a grandson was the fourth king afterwards. Took place in the, so in the time of Josiah, because it mentions that in Chronicles. And uh, here we have Jehoiakim. Um, I don't, Jehoiah has, I don't think it mentions uh, him, but uh, I'm not sure here. Let's see what it says. Until the 11th year of Zedekiah, uh, who was the last king, son of Josiah, king of Judah, who was another son of Josiah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now, that's the, now the end of the narrator, or except for this, maybe this very first sentence, and it says, and the word of the Lord came, oh, no, I'm sorry, so that would be Jeremiah. And the word of the Lord came to me, uh, saying, so now he is quoting Jeremiah. Before my, um, before my shaping you, that is God, in the belly I knew you, and before your coming forth from out of the womb, I sanctified you. So God knows us before we come out of the womb. He's shaping us in the belly. I believe he's doing that to every single person. I believe every single person, he has a special uh, gift for them that if they would follow him, they would receive. But if they don't, for different reasons, uh, could be the parent doesn't want them to and causes them not to ever come to God, or they do come and leave, and all sorts of possibilities. But uh, coming forth from out of the womb, I sanctified you. I set you, set you apart. My mother ha had me uh, when she was 44. I had She had a, a son when she was uh, 17 or 18. He was killed in the Second World War. And 
my mother uh, went to a Lutheran grade school and graduated from the grade school around 1913, something like that. I actually have the graduation uh, announcement. And so uh, after having the son uh, that was killed and the, my mother and the first husband were divorced, she married my father. And then later when she was 44, uh, she had me. Now, what she did was introduce me to G- Jesus when I was, oh, let's say I was, before I was in kindergarten, I went to Sunday school. I remember going in and sitting there and I had a friend, Tom Tolliver, next to me. And Tom and I became good friends, and we still converse now, and we're in our our late 70s. And we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they gave us a little cardboard church where you put your pennies in the top like a little bank. And uh, so I believe that the Lord shaped me in the belly of my mother for me to translate the Bible. But I did walk away for 13 years. But before I did walk away, I went. she sent me to the same grade school she went to for uh, s- 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 uh, five years. Well, kindergarten would be six. Well, let me see. I, have, I went to fourth, fourth, fifth, and I mean, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So the f- five years in kindergarten. And the second, we moved out in the county in St. Louis. I went to St. Jacoby Lutheran School, and I have a thing here that I wanted to show you because I I still have it, and uh, here it is here. I don't know how well you can see it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And it says, uh, Charles, July uh, 14th, 1955, St. Jacoby on the back. So, I believe that God sanctified me. I think he sanctifies, uh, he could sanctify uh, everyone, but it doesn't always happen in life for some reason. Uh, This being set apart for him uh, gets changed sometimes by abortion. Uh, Then this here would be the number one place where it shows and where Jesus and John the Baptist were uh, sanctified from the womb. So now would you say that only these Three were sanctified, in the, if it's all it mentions in the Bible. No, I don't think so. Uh, God sanctifies in the womb. Well, us Christians know that. People of the nations uh, don't know that. Uh, and uh, I'm not even sure of, uh, well, I'm not going to go any further on, into that because today uh, we had um, a major <clears throat> uh, find of this uh, anti uh, president uh, politics going on with the FBI and the CIA and a man who was very much against Donald Trump, and I don't believe he's against Donald Trump, uh, is mentioned <clears throat> about uh, hating the people that were uh, uh, for uh, life, walking for the life of a baby, and he hated him. And so I don't really believe he hates uh, Donald Trump. He hates Christians hates God, basically. It goes back to there. A person hates God. And uh, in his letter, you could see it. And But anyway, uh, then Nehemiah, um, Jeremiah, uh, uh, continues here, and he speaks, and we have this conversation between God and Jeremiah through the rest of the chapter. And Jeremiah said, O being one, despota, we have a despot, uh, despota, Kyrie, the Kyrie eleison, God have mercy. In the liturgy, behold, I know not how to speak, uh, for I am younger. So uh, right away, he brings up the kind of the same thing that Moses said, that he didn't know how to speak. Uh, I guess finding an excuse of some sort. But he hit all of his bases when he was uh, announcing to who he was talking to, the being one. Master and Lord. So uh, everything he's covering all of his bases because, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, he's talking uh, to God. And now the Lord speaks and said to me, "Do not say that I am younger, for to all whomever I should send you, you shall go, 
and according to all, as much as I should give charge to you, you shall speak. All right? You should not be fearful from in front of them, for I am with you to rescue you, says the Lord. So Jeremiah is going to go through quite experience of walking with the Lord. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes uh, distress sets in, and you would think that it's the end, uh, that he would give up. But yet, <clears throat> God burns within Jeremiah. He continued his ministry. So here at the beginning, God is giving him this promise of what he's going to do. And the Lord stretched uh, his hand to me. So somehow, uh, however Jeremiah was seeing uh, Jehovah, physically, uh, or, it's, or if it was in some type of a uh, vision, doesn't say, but uh, the Lord stretched his hand to me and he touched my mouth. And I believe it was Ezekiel said that he was a man of unclean lips and they uh, had uh, angel, I think, touched his mouth with a hot coal. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have placed my words in your mouth. Wow. What a high honor to have God's words placed in your mouth. And uh, I, to me, it's a high honor to be able to go through and just to uh, read off all these words. And uh, the honor to me also is knowing that a lot of these uh, words that I, the Greek words I translated into English, and a lot of these things are the first time, first words of anybody has ever seen uh, in the uh, English language, because it's a very literal translation, and nobody has quite translated it the same. I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, <clears throat> to brag, but I'm just thinking about how the honor of having God's Word come out of our mouth. You can have God's Word come out of your mouth as well as me and well as Jeremiah. Uh, whenever you see somebody and the, you know the path is open to tell them about the Lord, say a prayer and the Holy Spirit will speak through you, just as he did Jeremiah, me, and you. Then he continues, Behold, God, I have ordained you today over nations. That's interesting. It's not over Israel, but over nations and over kingdoms. So there's way more to this whole book than just uh, the Jews. Because <clears throat> right here at the beginning, uh, God is explaining to him, and we'll see this uh, start coming into fruition in this first chapter a little bit later here. And uh, to root out, to raise, and to loosen, and to rebuild, and to plant. All these things will be in the book of Jeremiah. And came to were, uh, and came to pass uh, the logos of the Lord to me. The logos, uh, Jesus became the logos, saying, "Well, what do you see, Jeremiah?" And I said, "Well, walnut staff." In the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I am vigilant over my words to do them. The walnut uh, staff, uh, the only other place it mentions a, a walnut, walnut uh, were the uh, three rods that Jacob took and he peeled the bark off of the one and he set these um, uh, rods in front of the water when the sheep and the goats, whatever it were, they uh, came and uh, it would stimulate them sexually by looking like the, for lack of a better term, the rear end of the female, and uh, by the um, different colors, the way he had it set up. Apparently he thought that would work, and apparently it did, because uh, he ended up with more of the uh, livestock than Laban and became a rich person by doing that. So the walnut was one of the three rods. Uh, then the staff, a walnut staff, Says, it tells us more in the Bible about this uh, staff. Uh, Israel was uh, to eat the Passover uh, when they were leaving uh, in Exodus 12, 11, with a staff in their hands. So the staff had something to do with, uh, with a movement. They used this in the moving around. And I've seen a man walks down the street with a staff in his hand uh, every day. And... Uh, so that's uh, still used for that. Second Kings 4, 29 to 30 and 31, it says, Isaiah had his staff placed on the Shumanite's woman's son who had died and uh, 
uh, by Gehazi, his um, helper. And so there, uh, the staff was of authority of that. Uh, Isaiah had this authority uh, that God had given him. And then uh, in Psalms 23, 4, it mentions about your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So here, uh, this uh, staff, the I'm vigilant, uh, is um, over my words to do them. So uh, whatever he is saying, he's going to do, and the staff has the authority and shows that um, he, God is going to do what he wants to do. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 24, it says, the one who spares the staff detests his son. Here, the staff is used as a instrument for punishment. So this may very well be what he's talking about here, a walnut staff. Well, you've seen, for I am vigilant over my words to do them. I am going to beat the heck out of somebody. Another possibility. <clears throat> Proverbs 14.3, it says, from out of the mouth of foolish ones is a staff of insult, something that uh, is used with authority against uh, people that are wise. And then in Jeremiah, later Jeremiah 48.17, it says, and he's talking against Moab, oh, how the renowned staff is broken, the rod of magnificence, and this is of Moab, not of not God's. So uh, God is, uh, yeah, is going to do what he says. And the word of the Lord came to me, pass from out of a devteru, second time to me, saying, what do you see? And I said, well, a kettle being fired up, fire underneath it, and the face of it towards the face of the north. And the Lord uh, said to me, from the face of the north shall burn away the evils upon all the ones dwelling the land, it could be the earth. Uh, for behold, I call together all the kingdoms from the north, says the Lord. Now, uh, now, what is the kettle uh, that he's seeing that has a fire underneath it? Basically, it, you, the word kettle appears many places, and it's generally for meat. Uh, this is what they cook the meat in. It was used in the tabernacle for cooking the meat in. Elisha was there where they uh, had the uh, kettle of stew and it was poisoned and Elisha healed the kettle of stew. And uh, in Psalms 108.8, uh, it mentions that Joab is the kettle of my hope. Now, I'm not exactly sure if he means he's going to uh, destroy the ones of Moab and they're going to be basically uh, done away with or not. But then the really an interesting one is against Jerusalem. And it says that in Ezekiel 11, 3, uh, that this is the kettle and we are the meats. So the kettle uh, is, uh, are the meats, and this kettle is, are the people of Jerusalem. This is also brought out in Ezekiel 24, 6, Amos 4, 2, and Micah 3, 3. So the meat here is the people of Israel, Jerusalem mainly. And uh, the uh, kingdoms uh, from the north. And for behold, I call together all the kingdoms from the north. Uh, when it says dwelling the land, the land of Israel, uh, shall burn the, the evils upon all the ones dwelling the land. Well, I believe that that is for an end time. I believe he's talking about the future when the beast, uh, and because it talks about all the kingdoms coming uh, from the north. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the only one that came down from the north. It wasn't a, a bunch of kings or a group of kings. But where do we see that? If you go to Daniel 11, read Daniel 11, uh, you'll see the kings, uh, kingdoms uh, from the north uh, in Daniel 11. And then if you go to Revelation 9, 13 to 21, you'll see the kingdoms appear there again. Then a Revelation 16, 12 to 16, the kingdoms again. And finally, a Revelation 17, 1 to 13. And all this is at the end times. So these kingdoms uh, from the north. And it, it's just, to, to, I don't want to go, I can't go through the whole book of Revelation again. I'd love to. But uh, if you read those, you'll see, you know, open up all of this of who it's talking about. It's not Nebuchadnezzar here. 
they shall come and shall each shall put his throne upon the thresholds of the gates of Jerusalem. As far as I know, that never happened. It will happen, though. And upon all the walls round about and upon all the cities of Judah. And I shall speak to them with judgment concerning all their evil uh, as they abandoned me. And now I think them is uh, Israel of the future, uh, Babylon, the harlot city. Uh, They sacrificed, they abandoned me, they sacrificed to strange gods, who I don't know who that would be, but it could be uh, bowing down or sacrificing to a strange god. could be something to do with uh, computers, possibly, uh, the, the beast. And they did obeisance to the works of their hands, which could be very much some type of an electronic or a robotic type thing of the future. Uh, And you gird your loin and rise up and speak to them all as much as I should give charge to you. Well, now, he didn't go around talking to all these kings. He did later with uh, the ruler from Nebuchadnezzar, but he didn't talk to all these kings. So I believe that he's talking about here is the word, uh, his word, it's going to go out in the book of Jeremiah that we're, I'm teaching right now or bringing out. You should not be fearful from in front of them, nor should you be terrified before them, for I am with you to rescue you, says the Lord. So I believe in this future time, if we are in the position, the Lord has us to not to be afraid of them, but to tell them of what's going to happen as uh, Jeremiah is telling the people of Israel. Uh, that Babylon is going to take over, and in the future, the beast will take over, destroy Israel and Jerusalem, just as Nebuchadnezzar. Behold, I have made you in today's day as a fortified city and as a fortified wall of brass altogether against the kings of Judah and its rulers. So now he's talking about how uh, these four kings do come against Jeremiah want to get rid of him. The rulers want to get rid of him, and they do a good job of almost uh, killing him, throwing him in a pit. We'll find out about that later. Uh, And to the people of the land, but he's fortified by Jehovah. And they shall wage war against you, all these, the rulers and the people, but in no way shall they be able to prevail against you, as we find out at the end that he prevails over them. They're all gone, and he is still alive. For I am with you to rescue you, said the Lord, and I believe the same will be for us. If we are at the time of the beast, uh, that the Lord will uh, fortify us to tell the people of the things that they need to hear about staying, uh, to not take the mark of the beast. Uh, Even if they lose their lives, they'll gain uh, their eternal everlasting eonial life. Chapter 2, our next video seminar, Israel Abandons the Lord. And we'll find out what that's all about. Second chapter. And hope you'll join us. And God bless.